After the Greenwich and Truro by-election successes, the Alliance is beginning to dream once again of getting its hands on the levers of power. Though a lot can still happen before the election, which now seems to be rapidly receding to October, when the Tories would hope the Alliance revival will have petered out. That's not the view of SDP leader David Owen, though. He still thinks the election could come in May or June to try to stop the alliance before it gains even more support. And he said the Tory ploy of trying to frighten people out of voting for the alliance was wearing thinner and thinner. The fear of a Labour government had become one of the last things that were holding people into continuing to support the Conservatives. Now that that fear has been removed, because there isn't going to be a Labour government. People can vote as they want to vote. More and more people are beginning to realise that the true slogan is a vote for the Alliance, let's in the Alliance. But Mr Kinnock's party still needed a demolition job, he said, and the Labour leader's visit to Washington provided the chance. It had been disastrous. No American politician, let alone President Reagan, would give the time of day to unilateralist defence policies that were deeply damaging to NATO. Now, it's because of his handling of this sort of issue that he's been unable to establish a reputation for statesmanship and a reputation for putting Britain's interests first. <coughs> and if he continues like it, the fact will become ever clearer to the electorate that as long as he continues to advocate the defence policies that he does, then he is unfitted to hold the office of Prime Minister of this country. Yeah. <laughs> Mr Kinnock would be well advised to read some of the speeches of his hero, Anarin Bevan, and one that he should have next door to him on his bedside table, is that speech when Anarin Bevan warned the Labour conference against sending a Labour foreign secretary into the conference chamber with the Soviet Union, naked, unable to argue against their nuclear arsenals with any policy other than that of unilateral nuclear disarmament. The fact is that Mr Kinnock has got his comeuppance on his visit to Washington and to New York, and he richly deserved it. The one disadvantage for us is that he went there as the leader of Her Majesty's official opposition. But at least the electorate had enough sense to send him there and the evidence of the opinion polls as the leader only of the third political force in this country. The Alliance, like the Tories, claim Labour's unilateralism makes nuclear war more likely, not less. But isn't the only real alternative to keeping the expensive Trident missiles planned by the Tories to replace Polaris? We are committed to, uh, to a credible deterrent system. That comes first. We think and we reject Trident uh, as unnecessary. The submarines are a different thing. We can take the submarines, they can be adapted. They, we are committed to the submarines, one being built at the moment, another one about to be built. No problems on that. But, uh, you know, the final decision about what alternative weapon systems would be, uh, uh, would be possible depends on classified information, which opposition parties don't have. Uh, Mr Kinnock seems to be slightly changing Labour's stance now and saying they wouldn't immediately remove cruise missiles if they came into power and negotiations were at an advanced stage. Mm. Are you concerned that this may be the start of a fundamental shift away from Labour's unilateralism that could steal your clothes? Yes, but, uh, you know, we're concerned about the good of the country. You know, if, if Labour, I mean, we used to have a bipartisan approach to defence in this country. It only really broke in 79 with Michael Foote and the Labour Party of those days. I mean, you know, uh, the heaven rejoice if, if, if rejoices if one sparrow repenteth or something of that sort. The, the fact is that uh, it must be good for the country if we get away from this possible option of unilateral disarmament. It's ridiculous. Now, if, if uh, the Labour Party want to go through the agonies of reassessing the defence policy at this very late stage, that will be seen for what it is by the general public. We're not worried about the electoral consequences of that. The Alliance now has its own leading lady to rival Margaret Thatcher and Glenys Kinnock, Rosie Barnes, the victor at Greenwich. She was given a rousing reception at Porth Call and told the conference her by-election victory, taking a safe seat from Labour, was a turning point. We found in Greenwich, and I'm sure you will find in many of your areas here, that there is a disillusionment with the Labour Party. There is a strong belief that Neil Kinnock 
is not the leader they need, has not got the credibility, is not holding the party together, and he has got the lid rather weakly on a pot which may boil over at any time. And nobody really knows what's in that pot, but they're very suspicious of it. She said it was vital to explain policies in layman's terms to win support and dismiss jibes that the Alliance had no real policies at all. Let nobody be mistaken uh, about our policies. Not only do we have them, but the other two parties are stealing them at a rate of knots. And if they were so wishy... <laughs> if they were as wishy-washy as Norman Tebbit would have the country believe, they wouldn't be appearing as they are in both of the other parties' manifestos in slightly different clothes. Greenwich was not just a, a great by-election that we'll look back on in years to come and see it as a great by-election standing on its own. We will see it as the time the tide turned and we will look back and say it all started when we won in Greenwich. We won as a team effort, we won with a concerted effort and we won by getting our message across to the people. They understood, they responded to it and they will do elsewhere. Thank you. One person who's regarded less warmly by some in the Alliance is Bill Rogers. The gang of four veterans who spoke at the conference dinner is under attack for suggesting moderate Labour MPs might still join the Alliance. He's accused of offering the Alliance as a rest home for out-of-fashion Labour politicians. The real question for people in the Labour Party after this election is whether they want to cling to the wreckage of a party which is slowly sinking, or whether if they're serious about this country and changing things, and if they do believe that Mr. Thatcher and his successors should not be in power forever, whether they recognize the thing to do is throw in their lot with the alliance, because we're rising, and that's what matters. The Welsh SDP believe they've embarrassed some of those moderate Labour MPs by making the running in supporting the South Wales NUM over the new super pit to be sunk near Port Talbot at Margham. Arthur Scargill opposes six-day working, which the local NUM has agreed to. And everyone thought the battle was over. But the long comes Arthur. You can rely on Arthur Scargill to oppose everything and propose nothing. As if there's going to be a pithead ballot, as Mr. Scargill is now suggesting. Very funny, as Russell said earlier. How outrageous. No pithead ballot for a national strike. He avoided that with all the capabilities of his, of his manoeuvrings. Very able man. He was able to outmaneuver most people. But when it comes to a pit in South Wales, Arthur Scargill said, says we must have a ballot. And what I am saying, and I hope what this conference is saying, if it is necessary for you boys to go it alone, if it is necessary for the establishment of a Welsh National Union of Mine Workers, let's do it. You have the resources, you have the background, you have the tradition, you have the calibre, and we'll be with you if you decide to go that way. And I'm very worried, frankly, by a national union that by its attitudes wants to jeopardise 2,600 jobs in South Wales, an area of extremely high unemployment, where we need those jobs. And that makes me angry. And it makes me angry not just because 800 mining jobs and 1,600 indirect jobs may be jeopardized by Arthur Scargill's maneuverings. But it makes me angry when I think of the jobs that have been lost in the South Wales coalfield directly as a result of the same Arthur Scargill. Nuclear disasters like Chernobyl could be the only alternative to coal, delegates warned. Plan for a PWR nuclear station at Hinkley Point were condemned. An area half the size of Wales around Chernobyl was contaminated, where the topsoil is unsuitable for agriculture for at least 10 years. Now, applied to Wales, assumption that there was, that, that tragedy had happened at Hinkley Point. We'd have a situation where you could draw a line from Abergavenny to Shrewsbury, take in all the uh, Glamorgans, Duffid, Powys, uh, Gwent, all of this area would be use useless for agriculture for 10 years. And he said the effect on people could only be imagined. 
there should be no new nuclear power stations till it was certain that they were safe. How then can a government ignore the evidence of a statistically unlikely event, but one which has actually happened? Nuclear power generation is a clearly dangerous technology. I feel that there has been a fundamental fallacy through this debate so far. One of the golden rules of all debate is to uh, examine like against like. And to examine Sizewell B against Chernobyl is not examining like against like, and it is like examining uh, an airship with a, a Boeing superjet. Well, after those opinion polls, the SDP spent much of the weekend hammering home its attack on Labour in a propaganda war over who will be seen as the main challenger to the government when the election comes. But the Conservatives didn't get off lightly either. If there's anything the Alliance hates more than being called a Mark II Labour Party, it's the idea that it's just toned down Toryism. Again, it was David Owen who set the agenda for the Alliance attack. We are deeply worried about the divisions and the despair that exists now in many parts of the United Kingdom. There are too many parts of the United Kingdom where too many children left school as long as five years ago and are still without a job. And these are decent, decent young people. They want a job. They want to contribute to society. They don't want to be put on the scrap heap. They are prepared to contribute, and we've got to allow them to contribute. Yes. It is a disgrace that so much potential is left, and when it's left alone, when it has nothing to do, we should not be surprised that it leads down into avenues which none of us would wish to see. Don't let the Conservatives get away with this mythology that the rise in crime is totally and completely unrelated to the rise in unemployment. Common sense tells us all that it is. But the Tories were right about some things, he said. We did have to sell our goods and there was nothing wrong with making a profit. But there had to be compassion. There is merit in praising individual effort. But there is also merit in understanding that we live as neighbours, we live in communities, and that it is not always wise or prudent for a government to pursue a course of open selfishness. <coughs> and one of the real criticisms of this government and of its budget was that it seemed unable to reach out to that majority of the people of this country who are in a job, who are reasonably well off, and say to them, this is a time when we're asking you to put your hateworth back into improving the lot of those who are without a job, those who are on low wages, those who still work, yet, and it should shame us all, they can fairly claim that they would be better off on the dole. The SDP were very concerned to calm the fears of the business community about what alliance success in the polls might mean. They attacked the Tories for wasting Britain's massive oil revenues and selling off national assets. Not that the alliance planned to re-nationalise industries the government has sold off. Politically, it's calculated the Tories have created too many shareholders to make that a wise option. The alliance think they know a Conservative vote winner when they see one. One reason they attribute to their success in overtaking Labour, even though it's only in one opinion poll so far. But there was some mock sympathy for the Labour Party, sympathy that Norman Tebbit wasn't speaking to them anymore. And as we know, life is indeed tough for third parties in British politics. Yeah. Especially under our electoral system which Labour has fought so desperately to preserve. We know what happens. Third parties get squeezed. And I've got a message for Mr. Kinnock. We intend to squeeze the Labour Party in Wales till the pips squeak. But cooperation with Labour was still possible, he said. It had worked in the Lib Lab pact under Mr Callaghan. Despite Tory jibes, he claimed the pact had notched up major achievements. Above all, for a short period, it brought about a total change in attitude in government and British politics. A change in attitude that was wholly for the good. Now contrast this 
if you will, with a period just a few years before, when we had the partisanship of a Tory government taking on the miners and plunging the whole country into a three-day week when even the hospitals had to go begging for electricity. Now, I have a message for conference today, and it's a very simple message. And it is that the Alliance understands business and it understands the economy, and that business and industry in Wales will be safe in the hands of the Alliance. If industry is safe in Alliance hands, the SDP strongly believe the health service isn't safe in Mrs Thatcher's. The conference heard an onslaught on the government's record in the NHS and on a leaflet published by the Welsh office claiming the health service has never been in better shape. Mr Chairman, I think documents like that should be subject to the Trade Descriptions Act. Because if it were, then the Welsh office and the Secretary of State could be prosecuted. Because I ask this question, who is responsible for this document? Is it Nicholas Edwards? Is it Mark Robinson? Whoever is responsible should resign, because I put it to you, it is a blatant sheet of Tory electioneering propaganda. It is a political document published at a cost of some £13,000 and is published by the Welsh office and is paid for by the taxpayer. And do they really think, who do they think they're conning? Do they really think that an elderly person suffering excruciating pain and waiting two years for a hip replacement operation will be happy with a glossy document. The teacher's industrial action is another target for Alliance criticism of the government. Delegates said the profession was demoralised. The removal of teachers' negotiating rights was a classic view that Whitehall knew best. But strikes weren't the answer. To go on systematically disrupting children's education by more strikes is merely going to arouse more hostility from parents who cannot understand why in this game of polarised politics it is their children who are the pawns and the victims. For the sake of the children, the teachers should abandon further strike action. We will all, whether parents or teachers, have the opportunity, the democratic chance at the next general election, to reverse, to get rid of this despicable act. If elected, we will repeal it. The, the fundamental weakness of the conservative approach to education lies not in, in detailed policy, detailed negotiation. The weakness of their approach comes from the weakness of their attitude to education because their attitude to education is that of the shop corner the penny and then the step. What's it worth? What's in it for us? What's it going to earn us? Education isn't something else that they're going to be able to flog off in this country. History is littered with cases of people who have fought bad law. And if all this party's contribution about the injustice that is now going on in the teaching profession is obey the law, then something is wrong. I do not want to hear... I do not want to hear any more mealy-mouthed platitudes from our party spokesman. Ladies and gentlemen, the education system is in a mess. This party has decimated the morale of the teaching profession. It has decimated the morale of the education service. The noises that should be coming from this party should be that it is wrong. Well, the SDP may disagree what to do about the teachers' dispute, but on most of their policy arguments with the Liberal Party, they've now patched up some acceptable compromise. Though their political opponents will certainly be looking for the join where the two parties meet and trying to unpick the seam as the election approaches. But on defence, both sides now agree to keep a minimum nuclear deterrent until it can be negotiated away. On nuclear power, they've added the Liberals' wish to phase it out to the SDP's plan to expand it and come up with a freeze. No new stations until it's clear they're safe. On unemployment, they want more public spending, but a new kind of incomes policy to avoid inflation. And unlike the other two parties, the Alliance want major constitutional reform. 
some commitment to changing the electoral system to proportional representation and decentralizing power, including setting up a Welsh Senate or Assembly. Well, devolution doesn't appear to be such a priority for Dr David Owen, and party leaders in Wales are worried he may not demand a high enough price on changing the electoral system if the alliance gets into negotiations in a hung parliament. Dr Owen's currently talking of seeking a referendum on it, and many alliance supporters in Wales remember another referendum on devolution. But Dr Owen sees the alliance's job in a hung or balanced parliament as curbing the excesses of Labour or Conservatives. There are two central tasks for this alliance to ensure that Labour's defence policies do not operate as the government of this country and Mrs Thatcher's economic policies and continued insensitivity and tolerance of unacceptable levels of unemployment do not operate as the government of this country. But which other party, Labour or Conservative, would the SDP leader prefer to negotiate with if the election produces the result he expects? It, it depends who's prepared to approach us and who's prepared to open the negotiations. In such a situation, for example, the Conservatives are still in government. You still have uh, no transfer of power. And it depends on the attitude of who wants to talk as to who we talk to first. But we bear in mind the views of the electors. And you can conceive that uh, you could go into some form of coalition, perhaps with members of the Alliance sitting in Cabinet with Mrs Thatcher as a Conservative leader? Yes, I uh, prefer another leader, to be honest, as I would uh, prefer another leader than Mr Kinnock. But I'm not in the business of choosing personalities. I'm in the business of negotiating on policies. Isn't it very difficult for the Alliance to go into the election saying we're expecting a balanced Parliament? It, it's not much of an aim, is it, to try and say we want you to vote for us, we hope there'll be a balanced Parliament. Shouldn't you be going for victory? Can't people vote for that? Look, people aren't stupid. The people listening to you, they can see what the polls are saying. They can work out what that looks likely. The poll results do point to a balanced Parliament. Now, I would obviously, like everyone else, prefer outright victory. Finally, briefly, Geoffrey Howe has recently uh, described the alliance as not a partnership for progress, but a partnership for paralysis and procrastination. Is that the kind of policies we'll be getting? It's a bit rich coming from old Geoffrey. He never seems to be able to make up his mind about anything. If anybody is more indecisive and woolly than Geoffrey Howe, I'd like to name it. It was once called like being ravaged by uh, Geoffrey Howe, has been like savaged by a dead sheep. And uh, he is the exponent of wooliness in British politics. I think the alliance is far more clear-cut than anything Jeffrey's ever said in his life. And the alliance leader in Wales, Gwynaro Jones. Oh, Jones, the former Labour MP for Carmarthen, who defected to the SDP, and who's now bidding to become the first president of the Social and Liberal Democrats. He's up against Des Wilson, former president of the Liberal Party, and Ian Rigglesworth, the former Labour and SDP member for Stockton. Mr Jones, when he was chairman of the SDP in Wales, achieved considerable fame as the thorn in the flesh of Dr David Owen. Now they've gone their separate ways, Mr Jones sees himself as the candidate from the regions, the grassroots man who's challenging the London establishment in the new party. He's certainly a popular speaker, but what sort of support was he getting? Well, it's difficult to say. It's a postal ballot of, what is it, 75 to 80,000 members. The balloting is taking place now. It has been going on since about the 1st of July. The ballot closes 27th of July, so it's coming towards the end. So it's difficult to say with the postal ballot. I'm standing precisely where I've been for the last few years. It's in terms both of the old alliance and the new party, which is that we should campaign to win, that we should change the face of uh, the system of government in Britain, that we should be a radical reforming uh, movement, keen for changing. You know, we were celebrating yesterday the glorious revolution well, we need another glorious revolution in Britain because we're a pretty undemocratic country still. And we haven't moved all that far in democracy over the last hundred years. More or less what the other two candidates are standing for as well. I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, they, they're saying broadly the same sort of thing. But they weren't saying the same thing, of course, uh, when they were in the, in the alliance. You know, Ian, for instance, was much closer to Dr Owen and his views than I was, for, for sure. Uh, on all issues like decentralisation, and the question of a hung parliament, which I had the, con the strategy of that, which I strongly uh, condemned and opposed. Uh, I suppose, yes, Des Wilson and I would be closer to each other than Ian and myself. Um, I think that would be fairer. Uh, so it's difficult to see how, how the balance will break out in the end on the, on the balloting.
Of course, they are an advantage, aren't they, in that they have this very impressive list. They both have a very impressive list of supporters and people like yes. uh, Lord Jenkins and Shirley Williams and so on. You, have, you got, haven't got any of those. Well, Shirley hasn't knocked us for anybody. Uh, it, it's a different style of campaign I'm leading. You know, I don't actually believe that establishment figures, which Ian most certainly is with a list of people supporting him, who are at the centre and what I mean by the centre of London, the metropolis, don't actually change much. Uh, they haven't got that campaigning zeal within them. And more often than not, I think the grassroots of certainly the old alliance, certainly the old alliance committee for Wales, and even with the new party, are, more clo are much closer to what should be done and uh, understand more people's desires and aspirations than people at the centre. So my campaign is not based on having a string of names. My campaign is based on, look, I told you so, it's all been wrong for the last three or four years. And if you want someone who's been consistent, who has been consistently attacking a variety of strands of thought that was developing, um, well, here I am. And uh, mind you, it's very difficult also for a Welsh person to break through. Yes, it, I was just going to say that. You've been going up and down the country. We've seen you in various parts of the country. Yeah. How, how's the Welsh rhetoric going down? And do, do they... Oh, that goes down well. Uh, I wish I had another 80 meetings to do between now and next week. I don't think there'd be any question of what the result would be then. The more people I meet... The, 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 the more converts I have, no problem with that. But I was just going to say how difficult it is for a Welsh person, not just the travelling, but to break through in British political terms. I now begin to understand how people like Neil Kinnock and those... And, uh, well, he, he made uh, the break, breakthrough, though. Well, yes, but it took him a long time, didn't it? Uh, you know, when I was a member of Parliament, Neil was doing a lot of the work I'm now doing, which is going around the regions and, uh, and constituencies of Britain. You've got to do that. Now, from a central base, which is a Westminster London base, uh, or South East of England base, that's much easier than someone who might be from Scotland or the North or from Wales. It's, it's a much more difficult task to achieve. So let's see what happens. Yes, elections very much in the air. Uh